Hi, I'm Meredith Ashby. I wanted to thank you for joining today to listen to my presentation. I wanted to talk to you about uh, long read sequencing and infectious disease and how advances in genome sequencing technology are allowing new insights into infectious disease genomes and uh, are helping us begin to make more progress against longstanding challenges in this area. So uh, it's no surprise to any of you who have logged in that uh, there are challenges of many different types when it comes to battling infectious disease. Some of them are more social in nature. Uh, for example, environmental degradation that leads to increases in uh, disease vectors, um, poverty in regions where infectious disease has a high burden, also political instability and poor public health infrastructure. But there are also a number of scientific challenges that, that combine with these. Um, and those would include uh, lack of laboratory model systems for parasites with complex life cycles, um, but also things like the lack of high quality reference genome, which limits our ability to understand the drivers of drug resistance and also to identify new targets. Um, and in addition to that, it can make it challenging to understand how uh, parasites or other um, uh, vectors of infectious disease are able to evade the immune system. Um, and all of this uh, is happening in the context of the rapid emergence of virulence and, and drug resistance. And uh, so, and I wanted to kind of share with you how some new technology is starting to help us make a dent in at least some of the scientific challenges. Uh, so, um, PEC Biosmart sequencing is a unique kind of sequencing technology in that it has four key characteristics that are quite different from short read sequencing that you may be more familiar with. The first is contiguity. So the read lengths with PEC bio sequencing are very long, over 30 kb in median read length, with some reads as long as 100 kb. Uh, we also have a very uniform coverage of all genomic contexts, no matter what the GC or AT richness may be. Uh, there, we have very high accuracy uh, and are able to achieve QV50 or 99.999% accuracy uh, with sufficient coverage uh, because we lack a lot of the systematic errors that are introduced by the PCR, which is a component of short read sequencing. And then finally, uh, PEC biosequencing is single molecule, which means that we are able to detect rare variants. Uh, So how does this play out in the context of genomes that are important for infectious disease? So I want to start by uh, going into some detail uh, about Plasmodium falciparum and how uh, new, better genome assemblies uh, have been able to, to move some research forward in that field. So as you probably know, uh, malaria is caused by Plasmodium falciparum, um, and malaria causes almost half a million deaths worldwide every year. Um, the plasmodium genome is organized uh, into 14 different chromosomes uh, at a range of sizes. And the first genome assembly for plasmodium was reported in 2002 using shotgun sequencing uh, methods. So, and then uh, previously there were additional attempts uh, with every ensuing technology to improve or add to the number of plasmodium genomes. One of the things that's most about this genome is that it's very high uh, AT rich, over 80% across the entirety of the genome. And the subtelomeric regions are particularly AT rich, often up to 99% AT rich. Um, and these subtelomeric regions uh, encode the hypervariable multigene families that we know are involved in both virulence and also in immune evasion. Uh, and in addition to these homologous families, there are also large segments of a very repetitive um, sequence. So as you can see from the chart below here, um, all of these previous sequencing technologies uh, were not able to do a very good job with providing a reference genome uh, that let researchers really dive into all of this complexity. Uh, so, for example, the number of contigs for Sanger sequencing was not so bad, uh, several thousand uh, contigs, but attempts to add to uh, the number of strains that had been sequenced with Illumina sequencing or 454 prior seeking sequencing um, were very unsuccessful, I would say. 
Uh, the Illumina sequencing assemblies have over 20,000 contigs each uh, with the NKB contig size, which is very small, only 1.5, less than 2 KB in length, which is barely long enough to contain a single intact gene, let alone to allow resolution of, of very homologous gene families that are often chained end to end across large regions. So uh, enter PacBio sequencing. Uh, in 2016, uh, PacBio undertook a, some, some collaborative uh, work to sequence uh, the plasmodium falciparum genome and to greatly improve the reference here. And so what I'm showing you here is the overall assembly statistics for this, this genome. And um, as you can see, all 14 uh, contigs our all 14 chromosomes have been resolved to a single contig, and these contigs stretch from telomere to telomere. And this means that, and not only, um, and, and that's significant, and one of the reasons that PacBio was able to do this was because of those unique qualities uh, that we, uh, that I discussed before. Namely, Namely, uh, the combination of very long read length with low context bias uh, was really game changing. So as you can see here, the read lengths for this genome assembly were very long and that allowed us to span through these highly repetitive regions. And in addition to that, the low bias allowed even coverage even across uh, the centromeric regions. And in the bottom panel, what you're seeing there is the coverage of PacBio reads across contig 12, the entirety of contig 12, all the way from telomere to telomere. And what you'll see is that the coverage is, is quite high and very even across the whole region. And, that, and that's really a game changer when it comes to assembly. So what is uh, what was the, the benefit um, there? What is the, um, what is the key advantage? Uh, it, one of the, the things that I think most researchers will understand is that oftentimes uh, those regions of high homology that are so difficult to assemble are often the most important ones to decode because they, uh, all of that repetitiveness facilitates genome recombination events and changes. And those parts of the genome can often be under uh, the most selective pressure and where most of the exciting things are happening uh, in terms of what's going on with immune evasion and drug resistance in some cases. Right? And so one example of that, I could show you one example of that, which was highlighted in the paper. Right? And so here, what you'll see is that in chromosome 10, uh, there's a um, 14 KB duplication event that was apparent in the SMART sequencing assembly relative to the Sanger reference. And this um, change, this duplication, resulted in the addition of three more Riffin genes to the plasmodium genome. And Riffin genes are vir virulence molecules that are expressed on the surface of infected erythrocytes during the mitotic uh, phase of expansion. And these mediate the binding of infected red blood cells to the vasculature. Um, and, we're, and they're you know, undergoing antigenic variation. And so these genes are super important in understanding the course of the disease and also virulence and differences in virulence between strains. And, and these are the kind of insights that are now possible when you have a fully assembled um, genome that includes uh, those subtelomeric regions. Uh, after uh, genome assembly um, was published, uh, an additional 15 plasmodium isolates uh, were later uh, assembled also with PacBio technology and also to, to near completeness. And in this case, uh, five of these were laboratory slains um, and 10 were clinical isolates. And what you'll see if you scan down uh, is that all of these contain the telomeric uh, sequence and most of these or a number of these have chromosomes uh, in which uh, both telomeres are also attached. So all of these are, are high quality assemblies and also allow the type of deep dive and uh, analysis into real biological problems um, that was so challenging with the less contiguous genome assemblies. And it's a highly contiguous assembly. That makes the short read data that you have on hand much more useful, right? Because when you have short reads,
uh, and the uh, uh, they can be mapped to a higher quality assembly and allow for, for you to understand um, whether uh, the data contained within those reads, whether those genes have been rearranged or in their same place, or whether there are additional variants. Um, and and all, all manner of questions like that are a lot easier to address once you at least have a high quality reference genome uh, that you can use to analyze those strains. And the authors point out here, uh, because of the highly polymorphic nature of the subtelomeric regions and the internal Vargene sequences, most short reads uh, from these areas uh, could not previously have been aligned uh, to the reference genome. And now that there's a diversity of plasmodium isolates from all over the world, uh, this makes this a lot more possible. Due to the completeness of our assemblies, it's now possible to characterize other core genes that have previously been difficult to access uh, with short reads uh, because these genes are too diverse to be aligned well enough to enable confident SNP calling. So a lot of times uh, people recognize that long read sequencing, uh, the key advantage there is that you are better to able to see structural variants and large scale changes in the genome. But I just wanted to point out that having a better genome assembly, uh, which uh, requires long reads, also enables you to do better SNP calling, right? Simply because you can now map those uh, short reads uh, onto the single correct place in the genome uh, that they're derived from. And in that way, you can tell the difference between genes and pseudogenes, between genes and new du duplications. And you can really understand much better uh, things like um, drug resistance that may in fact be uh, SNP driven. Uh, so one of the other things that was highlighted in this paper is that the um, the core genome in Plasmodium falciparum is highly conserved, and there's a lot less uh, rearrangement events that happen in that core area, whereas the subtelomeric region is highly prone to structural variation. And one of the things they wanted to identify is where is the exact boundary between uh, the core and the subtelomeric genome here? Uh, because they wanted to understand, well, which genes exactly are subject to this higher rate of structural variation and which tend to be more conserved. And so they devised a, a cutoff point uh, where uh, the core boundary delineation is defined as the point closest to the telomere at which uh, eight out of 15 or more than half of the genotypes cease to align. And so what I'm showing on the left now uh, is one example for one of the genomes uh, showing how uh, the left and the right telomeres, you see that alignment um, is uh, uh, robust uh, in the central part of the genome, but there's a super sharp drop off when you try to align the other, the new 15 genomes against the original reference. So that cutoff is really abrupt and, and very sharp. And if you want to read more details about the structure of that, I encourage you to, to, read, the, to read the paper. So uh, again, um, this all sounds very cool. It's very nice. Um, but if you're not a genome assembly geek, uh, like we are at PacBio, um, what does that mean? What is the point? Um, how is that helpful to you? Well, we are, since these assemblies came out just a few years ago, we are now beginning to see publications that highlight how uh, the better genomes are allowing uh, new discoveries. So this is one example of, of an article that I really liked. Um, and this is about how a multi-population genomic analysis uh, it shows that there's uh, local selection and differentiation at the GDV1 locus that seems to regulate um, sexual development and may be, involved, may be under high selective pressure. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about the GDV1 locus is that deletions in that area have been associated with a loss of sexual st stage uh, gametogenesis among laboratory lines, meaning that parasites with those deletions uh, can no longer be transmitted through mosquito vectors. So to examine whether any of uh, these naturally occurring polymorphisms that they found here may be present, long resequencing data uh, for several isolates were then examined, including for some, uh, some new clinical isolates. So the first thing they did is they had uh, short read data that they collected from 680 different clinical samples uh, that were collected from all over West Africa. And these were mapped back against the new high quality reference uh, that was assembled PacBio. And they looked at 32,000 different SNPs 
utilize these for linkage disequilibrium to try to identify sites in the genome that were under strong selective pressure. And what they found, if you look at the, the charts here, um, so each time you alternate from black to red, you're moving into a new chromosome. And what you can see that a lot of these hotspots for uh, linkage disequilibrium or strong selective pressure tend to be towards the ends of those chromosomes, right? So they're subtelomeric. And these regions were previously dark uh, to all of us because without an assembly, it's very hard to map data to those regions and very hard to determine what genes are actually located in those regions that are under strong selective pressure. Um, so what you'll see here, of course, is that a number of the hotspots that are coming up are, are well known and are linked to either chloroquine or antifolate uh, drug resistance. Um, but there are also uh, some interesting things that cropped up that were uh, not necessarily expected things they wanted to look at is since they had these samples that had been collected over such a, a wide area of Western Africa, is they wanted to understand whether the allele frequencies of the, in these regions under selective pressure uh, had a geographical pattern to their divergence. And uh, when they uh, narrowed it down, uh, those 32,000 SNPs, they found that only 17 had significant geographical divergence. And one, the one locus with the most exceptional differentiation uh, in chromosome nine, indicated by the arrow, uh, is linked to a gametocyte uh, development gene, GDV1, and particularly its uh, three prime intergenic region. So long read sequencing revealed that there are actually two mutually exclusive deletions uh, near these chromosome nine SNPs. And so the way that they were able to ascertain this is that they they made a um, kind of a dummy reference that included um, both of these um, deletion, possible deletion events. And then they map back all of the data from each of the clinical isolates to these, right? And uh, so normally that wouldn't occur in nature, right? These are uh, mutually exclusive. But when you set up a, a, um, a reference in this way, what it does is it allows those short reads uh, to very clearly map um, either over uh, the uh, to the one region where it exists in the reference here or the other region here. And so it becomes a lot easier um, to, to parse out uh, which has a deletion and, and which does not because the reads sort quite naturally uh, to the one allele or the other. Also within this figure here at the very bottom you'll see is uh, the reference genome for for P. Raikanawi, and that was included as an outgroup, um, and that is um, a species of Plasmodium that uh, infects apes, and, and that has neither deletion, um, and it was interesting primarily because it shows that this deletion event and this bimorphism has occurred subsequent to speciation uh, into um, the species that infects, infects humans. Um, so what are the what are the differences in distribution uh, between these two uh, deletion events? So what they found is when they when they remapped to these hybrid references, they found that uh, the geographical distribution of uh, the alternative deletion in blue uh, is highly correlated with the allele frequencies seen for the highest chromosome nine SNPs. Right, and so this is interesting because you know the the SNPs are easy to detect with short reads, but it was only by mapping the short read data back to the high quality reference genome that it was noticed that there are these very large uh, deletion events right by the SNPs. Right? And so that begs the question: um, which is actually uh, the the genomic change uh, that is under high selection? Is it the deletion event or is it the SNPs that are in linkage, linkage disequilibrium with it? Which one is actually causing a biological effect? Um, and so this is not a question that they were able to answer uh, fully in this paper. Um, so, but there are some interesting hints. So the region that's near GDV1 is known to undergo deletions in some laboratory adapted parasite isolates, as I said before, and that causes uh, those isolates to lose the ability to infect mosquitoes. Um, and there was a recent paper, not this paper, that was uh, shown that antisense RNA can silence GDV1 transcription and prevent commitment to sexual stage development. And of course, this deletion event is happening in the three prime um, region, which 
means that it's entirely possible that it's the antisense RNA uh, sequence that is being impacted by this deletion event. Um, so this certainly uh, provides some really interesting opportunities for scientific follow-up. Um, the authors uh, try to speculate what what might be driving, what, what um, specific types of pressure might be driving this differential selection in Senegal and, and Gambia versus the rest of West Africa. Um, could it be differences in ecology? Um, so Senegal and Gambia are much more coastal. They have a lot more brackish water that is drawn into the river systems there versus in um, more centrally located Africa. So that could be one difference. Uh, are there differences in mosquito vectors? It's known that the ecological differences in Senegal and Gambia uh, result in different specific mosquito species being present or absent, and also that those mosquito species can interbreed. And so it may be that this change, the sexual morphism, uh, might be uh, related to the need to be able to survive in several different fly species. Um, could it be differences in parasite and and the medicity, uh, meaning uh, how how many of these flies are actually infected with malaria. Uh, so interestingly, there has been a big drop in um, endemicity in Senegal and Gambia over the last five years or so. Um, but the authors thought of that and they went back and they got some banked older samples and they found that the uh, allelic, allelic differences uh, precede or predate uh, the drop in endemicity. So they think that maybe that's not the case. Uh, maybe it's not related to um, you know, a need to try to survive until there's enough mosquitoes or enough opportunities to, to reinfect. So um, again, unsolved question. And uh, you know, for me as a scientist, I think that the best discoveries are the ones that yield more questions than answers. And this definitely falls into that camp. Um, so of course, malaria uh, cannot infect people on its own. It needs the help of the mosquito. And interestingly, uh, there's also uh, some recent improvements in the mosquito genome assembly using PacBio. Um, so similar to Plasmodium, Aedes aegypti genome is highly repetitive. If you look on the left here, uh, the pie chart shows that the vast preponderance of the mosquito genome is uh, comprised of LTRs, retrotransposons, signs, mites, uh, unclassified repeats, and even simple and tandem repeats. And only a very small part is um, you know, easy to assemble with short read sequencing. And as a result of that, if you look at the bottom left, um, you can see the difference between uh, the short read assembly that researchers were working with in the past versus what they have now with the PAC bio assembly. So the way that the uh, assembly contiguity is rendered here is that each little box corresponds to a single contig, right? And the contig size at the right um, is uh, the scale is shown. And so what you see that the short read assembly is all black because the boxes are so small, uh, you can barely even see where one contig goes to the next. But the PAC bio uh, assembly, all three chromosomes are very well organized and ordered. And the contig number decreased from over 37,000 contigs down to just 2,500, uh, decreasing the contig N50 from 84,000 base pairs all the way to 11.8 megabases. Uh, so now we have much better uh, ability to look into this Aedes aegypti genome and understand um, what's going on and how um, how that uh, mosquito genome may be interacting with the plasmodium genome. Um, so the reference genome um, uh, publication went into a fair amount of detail about all the different types of gene families that can now be annotated with this higher quality reference, right? And so of interest, uh, particular interest to these authors um, was uh, the enormous class of, of odorant receptors, gustatory receptors, and ionotrophic receptors, all different kinds of chemosensory molecules that are highly diverse and also very homologous. This is kind of like the worst case scenario, the most difficult to assemble part of the, the genome. And they wanted to point out what a bang up job long read sequencing did with identifying all of these. Uh, if you look along the bottom, the, part, the pie charts here are showing um, that the things in black did not change from the old to the new reference, but everything that's in gray, 
right, is merged, meaning uh, the short read assembly was not able to, to tell whether you were looking at the same gene or a different gene. And so in some cases, you had two copies of things that really were just one gene. And then similarly, in red, these are all new genes that were newly discovered, identified, and annotated in the higher quality assembly. Um, and some of these gene families, in particular the um, ionotrophic receptors here, um, there was just an enormous number of new genes that were that revealed. Um, so maybe more of more interest to people that work in the infectious disease area would be uh, serine proteases um, or metalloproteases. So these proteases mediate either immune responses um, or uh, the metalloproteases are linked to uh, vector competence, uh, meaning whether the fly is able to serve as a host for, for malaria or not. Um, and what they found uh, here, just briefly, is that half of the 404 serine and metallogies protease gene models were improved in the new reference, and 49 novel proteases uh, were discovered. So hopefully, um, and th this was only just published in 2018, and hopefully this new reference will uh, yield new insight into um, all kinds of, uh, of things that are important for infectious disease. Um, so here's uh, one example, um, which I think is, uh, is highly interesting. Um, as with plasmodium, um, having this high quality reference has uh, facilitated uh, work in population genetics. So not only did they sequence uh, one reference genome, they went and they took all kinds of population data, short read data that they had previously, and they used a new reference to leverage that data to identify sites in the genome that were under high selective pressure. And uh, one thing that they identified uh, are some, some hot spots uh, that are under a selective pressure for insecticide resistance. And they did this by studying mosquitoes that are um, either resistant or not resistant that are located in Mexico. Um, and what they found is that there's a number of SNPs on chromosome three that do indeed correlate with um, delta methrin resistance. Um, and these SNPs center on a, a new approved gene model of voltage-gated sodium channel gene, VGSC, right? And so in the old reference, this gene was not well assembled. So while you could see that parts of this genome were under selective pressure, it was impossible to know that all of those SNPs actually located to that, uh, to that specific gene. Um, so hopefully this is only the first of lots of discoveries of this kind that are going to help researchers hone in on genes that are most important uh, for things like insecticide resistance um, or um, vector competence. And, and in the area of vector competence, um, not shown here, but I, I encourage you to read the paper, uh, there are a number of quantitative trait loci on chromosome 2 that were linked to systemic uh, dengue fever dissemination in mid-gut infected mosquitoes. So also very promising. Um, okay, so uh, that kind of covers what I wanted to say about plasmodium. Um, but um, plasmodium, Aedes aegypti are not the only genomes uh, that are important to infectious disease reachers, which have recently been improved with the help of long read sequencing. So there have been a number of publications recently focusing on trypanosome genomes. Um, so uh, trypanosomes are, are another kind of parasite uh, that cause a number of diseases, including uh, leishmania and sleeping sickness, among others. Um, so here's an example of a new uh, T. cruzi uh, assemblies of two different strains, TCC and DM28C. And uh, what you'll see here is that these, um, with very reasonable amounts of coverage, uh, these have now been assembled, and there's been an over tenfold improvement over the previous short read um, assemblies. And several of the contigs from this assembly correspond to entire chromosomes, much like with the Aedes aegypti uh, genome. And the assembly reveals uh, a tremendous amount of genome complexity, much greater complexity for multi-copy gene families uh, related to infection processes and disease development, including uh, transthiolidases, mucins, and mucin-associated surface proteins. And as with uh, the plasmodium genome, it was found that a lot of these multi-copy families are located in the telomeric regions uh, where they are likely under uh, very high evolutionary pressure and subject to frequent changes and rearrangements. Um, so this, this article um, 
was only published in 2018. And I think it's only the, the beginning of uh, new information that I'm sure researchers in this area are going to be able to leverage to start to understand um, exactly what's going on with these multi-copy gene families and how they relate to um, drug resistance uh, and virulence, among other things. Uh, here's another example of a uh, trypanosome uh, improved reference genome. And, and this one uh, is uh, which is a really terrific paper uh, that came out in Nature uh, over the past year. Uh, T. brucei causes sleeping sickness. And um, what you'll see here is that the genome was almost completely a a assembled and very highly ordered. So every time um, this flips, um, the, the gray bars underneath the coverage plot uh, flips, that is a different contig, right? But all of the contigs are organized and ordered. Um, and in all cases, most cases, you can see in red uh, the uh, subtelomeric regions where VSGs, which are the surface antigens on sleeping sickness um, called variant surface glycoproteins, um, all reside. Right, and so once again, as with Plasmodium, the, these uh, highly polymorphic um, gene families that are critical uh, to immune evasion are all located in these very hard to assemble subtelomeric regions, which are now accessible uh, with PacBio. Um, and the new reference contains, um, particularly interesting here is that, so these genes are only transcribed when uh, one at a time, uh, they are mutually exclusive, and they are only transcribed when they have been transposed or located within a telomeric bloodstream form or a BEF expression site. And so one of the challenges before is that neither uh, neither the subtelomeric VSG dense regions nor uh, the BEF sites were well assembled in the prior genome, and now uh, they are both very well assembled in the new genome. And once again, I, I don't have time to go into great detail here, but the authors were able to use a combination of long read sequencing and also high C um, and single cell sequencing to understand how these two parts of the genome interacted together and were subject to rearrangement events in order to cause that antigen switching, uh, which is known to make it so difficult um, to treat uh, sleeping sickness and to develop a, a vaccine against it. So once again, I encourage you to read this paper to learn more about um, um, how uh, how the better reference has uh, allowed new insights into how sleeping sickness evades the immune system. So switching gears a little from uh, parasites uh, to bacteria now. So. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with PacBio because of our work with bacterial genome assembly. Uh, and I wanted to highlight one particularly interesting project that was completed recently um, with uh, the uh, Wellcome Trust and the NCTC. So the NCTC is a part of Public Health England, and their mission is to uh, collect and preserve strains that are important uh, to human health. Uh, and to hold these as a resource that is available to the entire scientific community uh, in order to help us understand how bacteria evolve and change over time, uh, and also to provide references so that we can organize and study uh, new bacterial uh, strains and more virulent strains that, that, are, that are rising all the time. Uh, and so, uh, when Sanger decided that they needed to have better reference assemblies for their entire collection, uh, they decided to go with PacBio as the long resequencing partner. Um, and the reason they chose us was uh, for all of the reasons uh, that I've already been discussing with respect to you know, plasmodium and trypanosomes. Namely, we are able to sequence through both GC and AT rich regions. We can uh, give access to complex regions of the genome, including um, IS elements, um, and phage insertion events. Uh, our data maps to both re repetitive genomes and is capable of detecting structural variants, including gene loss, gene insertion, uh, transposon rearrangements. Um, and even better, we are able to uh, characterize methylation patterns um, at the same time as sequencing. Um, finally, we can detect mi minor variants. So, uh, and I uh, have many examples of customers who are able to find uh, drug resistance that emerges very rapidly, even in a culture um, condition. Um, and then uh, we are able to uh, do all of this very quickly with just a 10 hour runtime and without introducing any amplification bias or PCR errors.
So uh, they have so far uh, extracted DNA from over 3,000 strains uh, from 852 different species uh, and 82 different families. And you can see on the right that this encompasses a, a wide range of the uh, bacterial clad. Um, sequencing began in 2013 and was completed uh, last year, but they continued to sequence additional genomes that were outside the scope of the initial 3,000 that were targeted uh, for improved reference genomes. Um, and most of these were assembled into very few contigs, uh, and a number of them also had the plasmid sequenced and closed. Uh, the impact of all of this has been um, pretty profound in terms of the quality of information that is now available with the NCTC type strain. So uh, the vast majority of the type strains now have uh, complete reference genomes. Um, and prior to this, a large number of them had no whole genome sequencing data at all uh, for the entire species. So not even just the strain that's banked with NCTC, but for any member of the species at all. Um, and then 30% of those strains, there was no previous type strain uh, that was available. And that's challenging because oftentimes uh, when the type strain has not been sequenced, um, it's it's uh, sometimes it is discovered that the type strain is actually not very representative uh, of the other members of the species that have since been collected and, and studied. And so um, sequencing these type strains and making sure that they are the correct uh, in-group uh, for um, researchers to use as they try to drill down into what makes one strain virulent and, and the other drug resistant is, is super important. Um, so, um, we are very happy to work with them to start to fill in this gap uh, in public databases and to really enable researchers to do um, a more robust study. Um, and you'll see here that um, NCTC is very much focused on um, strains that are relevant to human health. And this includes, of course, a number uh, of species that should be very familiar to, to people that work in the infectious disease worlds, including um, influenza, um, diphtheria, uh, dysentery, um, uh, meningitis, and then the one I wanted to talk about in a little more detail, uh, Vibrio cholera. So just this past week, uh, there was an article uh, in, in the press about uh, the sequencing of an additional NCTC strain, NCTC30, which is a non-pandemic Vibrio cholera isolate that was collected back in 1916 from a hospitalized World War I patient who was reportedly suffering from diarrhea. And this is an interesting time point to collect because this was right at the end of the sixth cholera pandemic. Uh, we are um, currently in the seventh, or some might argue that we're past the seventh and we may be entering uh, an eighth pandemic. Um, but in, in any event, this one was super interesting because while we have a number of strains that were collected during the height of the pandemic, this one is interesting because it's toward the tail end. And of course, it's interesting not only to know what strains looked like during the height of a pandemic, but also how they might have changed or, or evolved as uh, these pandemics came to a close. And very few cholera uh, isolates are uh, available from this time period. So it makes for a very interesting and valuable isolate uh, to do uh, genome comparison studies. So the really interesting thing about this genome is that it lacks the pathogenicity islands that are found in classical uh, V. cholerae. So, it's missing. So here you have a comparison between this strain, NCTC30, on the bottom of the chart, and uh, another strain, which is far more typical uh, of Vibrio cholera. And what you'll see is that there's a large uh, genome inversion that has happened on the chromosome here. Um, and during the course of this inversion, a number of, in addition to the inversion event, some of these pathogenicity islands were simply lost. So here, where it says uh, CTX gene, um, you'll notice that at the top strain, there's just a white um, spot. And what that means is that there's no corresponding sequence in NCTC that is mapping back uh, to that um, bacteriophage region in, in the uh, VP1 and, and VP, uh, VPI1 and 2, two different pathogenicity islands. Uh, there's, uh, they are appearing in white with no green lines connecting uh, NCTC30 to the reference strain because those sequences are not present uh, in this very unique um, strain of cholera. Um, 
So that's very interesting to note that this uh, patient was sick with diarrhea, even though uh, these uh, very important uh, pathologists, the islands, were, were missing. Also very interesting is that while uh, NCTC30, which was collected in 1916, preceded the penicillin era, it is resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. And it harbors a gene that is uh, almost nearly identical uh, to BLA CARB7 and differs only by two base pairs um, from, from that. Um, so again, very interesting evolutionarily and that um, a lot of antibiotic resistance genes were already in circulation even before the anti advent of antibiotics. And it really drives home that um, you know, uh, bacteria exist in a constant state of warfare, not just with us, but with each other. And so not only are there a great place to find um, antibiotics, but they are a great place, uh, a great reservoir for antibiotic resistance as well. So I wanted to close by sharing with you that in the uh, next two weeks, we are going to be releasing our next um, sequencing system. Uh, the sequencing system is called the SQL2 system, and it is, the key difference between it and the current SQL system is much higher throughput. It has eight times as many ZMWs, meaning it can sequence eight times as many molecules at once. Um, it has still this very same long read length from the previous system, the very same high consensus accuracy, and uh, also the very uh, same high uniform coverage. The only difference is that the greater number of ZNWs allows you uh, to have much greater throughput on a single smart cell. Um, so for example, here, there's an example of uh, sequencing uh, an E. coli strain. In this case, we had 86 gigabases of data in one SQL2 8M smart cell. Um, and for comparison, the SQL system would have about uh, 12, 10 to 12 gigabases of data, so much more data. And uh, similarly, looking at uh, rice genome, uh, sequencing that, again, very high yield uh, in the mid-80 mid uh, gigabases. And um, even better, the price point is a lot more attractive as well. So whereas the SQL system, it costs about $800 to get that 12 gigabases of data, on the SQL 2 system, for about $1,300, you now get uh, 80 uh, 80 or more gigabases of data. Um, so I hope I've been able uh, to persuade you that uh, throughout the history of science, I think, um, development of new technology has been tightly linked to new scientific discoveries because new technologies allow us to address old problems in new ways through a new lens and to make new observations. Uh, and uh, PacBio is just one of many new tools uh, that are coming out and we live in a very exciting era where genomics uh, is improving so rapidly that it's almost hard to, to keep up with uh, the number of new discoveries that are uh, being enabled in this area. Um, and so uh, thank you so much uh, for listening to me and I uh, hope that if I feature your interest at all, you go to our website and check out all the interesting kinds of research that are being enabled um, with long read sequencing. Thank you so much.